this shining kind face is the vo is the face of pure demented madness. Dr. Amy Bishop in 2010-2011 shot up the University of Alabama at, at Huntsville, killing three, wounding an additional five. But all along there have been warning signs that something wasn't quite right with the good doctor. And that's what we're going to look into. This is the new type of video I'm trying out. It's kind of a walking pictorial tour of um, of the of the story. So I hope you enjoy it. I did record this outside, so there was some wind. So I apologize for that. But I just thought I would give it a try, and I hope you enjoy it. So with that being said, let's dive in to Dr. Amy Bishop, Harvard trained. Keto and crime, keto and crime, we uncover the crime on keto and crime. Keto and crime, keto and crime, now is the time for keto and crime. the case of Dr. Amy Bishop, who was Harvard trained, and you'll understand why I'm naming that that in just a little while. But this is uh, her picture here, and I just realized that I have the same haircut as her. So I might need to rethink my haircut. But uh, anyway, let's get into it, shall we? Now, um, Amy, this is a very interesting case because this happened again, not far from my hometown. Uh, I, was, I had long moved away by then, but um, it's still a very interesting study, I think. But um, this is her, Dr. Amy Bishop. She had a PhD in genetics. So of all the killers that we've looked we've looked at so far, this is definitely what you would call the most highly educated one. But um, let's get into it. She was born April 24th, 1965 in Braintree, Massachusetts, which is a suburb of Boston. She was the daughter of Samuel and Judith Bishop, who were, the, her father was a college professor at uh, Northeastern University in Boston, Massachusetts. She also had a younger brother, Seth, who was approximately four years younger. Uh, the entire family was highly educated. As I said, dad was a college professor. Mom was highly educated, even though she was a homemaker at the time. But um, there wasn't a whole lot of TV watching that went on in their house. Let, let's put it that way. They were always uh, interested. They were all musicians. Uh, Amy showed a huge proficiency for uh, playing the violin. As a child, her mother was also a musician. Uh, so there was a lot of cultural and artistic pursuits going on in that house rather than television watching. Everybody was an academic, everybody was a geek, everybody was an artist of some sort. So it was a, a pretty educational house to grow up in, I'd say. Um, from the first, Amy um, had a high sense of competition. She didn't like to lose. And that intensified when her brother Seth was born around 1969. When he came into the picture, there was a lot of sibling rivalry. They fought a lot. Um, academics came easier to Seth than they did to Amy, so she was always jealous of that. She really had to study to make A's. He seemed to be able to half it and 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 make A's, just that type of person. And I, I know that that's, you know, I had to work hard to make mediocre grades in high school, but um, and then when it came a lot easier to some cousins of mine, so it was just, kind of uh, annoying. So I understand how she feels about that. And it's not unnatural for there to be sibling rivalries. I mean, we all know that. But just bear in mind, it was a traditional white collar kind of growing up, a upper middle class suburb of Boston, and just some normal sibling rivalry going on. Let's move on. They both attended Braintree High School. Uh, again, uh, still sibling rivalry with grades coming much easier to Seth than they did to Amy. Uh, in 1982, after graduating from Braintree High School, she went on to attend the college where her parent, where her father taught, Northeastern University in Boston, to pursue a bachelor's degree in chemistry and biology. So she was definitely, a, she wanted to be a, in a STEM cell, a STEM career, which if you don't know what that means, it's science, technology, engineering, and math, STEM often considered the best majors to go into if you go to college because they're always high paying. So she definitely knew she wanted a career in the sciences, so she went on to 
pursue a bachelor's degree in science, biology, and chemistry, and some work in genetics, which would play into her later career. Uh, her brother also entered Northeastern University uh, about three years after his sister, and again, his grades came a lot easier than her grades, so her feeling of sibling rivalry began to intensify. Also around this time, uh, Seth joined the uh, rifle team at Northeastern, so there were two parts to this, but Dad went out, Samuel went out and bought a rifle for both Seth to practice uh, for, his, for his rifle team and also because their house had been burglarized. And this was in 1986, so there was a weapon in an under, otherwise unarmed household, which well, this is the Northeast, not unusual. It's not like down here in the South where we're normally armed to our teeth. But um, so he was, he bought it for home protection. And it was normally kept unloaded. That's key. So December 6, 1986, both kids were home for the weekend. Uh, Seth had gone grocery shopping with Judith, the mom. While there, Amy, in a, later on in a police deposition, Amy said that she became nervous about the break-in while she was there alone and decided to get the gun, the rifle, for protection. As I said, it was kept unloaded, so she, she got the rifle, she found shells, she loaded it, and she waited for her family to come home. Well, Seth and uh, Judith came home. They walked through the kitchen door. They placed the groceries on the counter. This is according to Judith's later testimony in both trial and uh, to the police. Uh, their backs were to the door leading into the dining room and the stairs where Amy came down with the loaded rifle. She walked into the kitchen. They both turned around and looked at her. She had the gun, she had the rifle, her hand over the, the trigger area and another hand over the barrel. And she pointed it at them and immediately her mother said, be careful, you're going to hurt someone with that, it could go off. But she looked at Seth and said, I can't get this unloaded, can you help me? Well, of course, Seth stepped forward to take the rifle and attempted to kind of walk around to take it from the barrel. But Amy kind of swung, keeping the nozzle on him. And at that time, her hand made a slight movement, according to her mother now, and the rifle went off, the barrel emptying into Seth's chest. Immediately, Seth dropped to the, dropped to the floor. His mom dropped down to check on him. She screamed while she grabbed the phone to call a neighbor of theirs who was a registered nurse named Debbie. She told, she called and she called, no one was home, which I think was stupid. Then she immediately dialed 911 and told Amy to run next door and get Debbie to come over and help Seth. So Amy didn't run. She meandered out the kitchen door towards their neighbors, but never stopped at the neighbor's house, according to passersby and trotted down the street, still holding the hot rifle that had just killed her brother, or shot her brother. Well, of course, Seth expired while on the floor because no one was there to help him. His mother was trying to put chest pressure on his chest to stop the flow of blood, but as we know, a chest injury is usually fatal unless there's immediate medical, deep medical attention given. So she, he did die. Amy continued to trot down the block, went to the body shop of a car dealership at the end of her block, oh, actually three blocks away, went into the body shop and turned the gun on a mechanic, that, a technician that was standing there. He immediately put up his hands and she said she wanted a car. Well, someone in the office, of course, saw this and called the police immediately. She just stood there waving the gun. The Technician was backing away, backing away, backing away. When finally the police arrived, one officer, one Braintree uh, officer ran in. She turned the gun on him. He immediately pulled his weapon, his sidearm, and held it. And there was a standoff, basically considered a Mexican standoff between the police officer and, at this time, 21-year-old Amy Bishop. So all the time he's convinced her to put down his gun. Now, the 80s must have been an entirely different world because I know now if you've got a gun drawn on an officer, they're most likely going to shoot you. They're not going to waste their time trying to get you to put the weapon down. It may have also had something to do with the fact this is an upper middle class neighborhood and she was a white female. I don't want to get into the whole political debate about uh, white privilege, but there was something weird going on there because uh, you have a gun on a police officer and you're refusing to put it down. Uh, that's a recipe, in my opinion, to get yourself shot justifiably. But uh, anyway, while they're talking, another officer had circled around and came in through the side door and came up behind her, 
put the gun to her and told her to please drop her weapon. And she did. She was immediately taken into custody and taken to the local police precinct. Uh, while there, she was interrogated. She insisted that it was an accident and she didn't even remember going into the car dealership or even trotting down the hall. She said the last thing she remembered was knocking on their neighbor Debbie's door, remember the RN, and saying and realizing that she wasn't at home. And from there, she only remembers being waking up in the police car. That was her official story. Well, the interrogation went on for about 12 hours and eventually uh, the police officers came in and released her after speaking with her mother who was the only eyewitness to the incident. Her mother testified it was indeed an accident. Uh, as I said, we don't know. We don't know what, what really happened, but her mother did testify it was an accident. And she was released into her mother's custody with no charges filed. It was ruled a terrible, tragic accident. Now, later came out that the, the local chief of police were good friends with her parents and they had pleaded with him. They've already lost one child who was 18 at the time. Seth was 18. And they didn't want to lose another, so she was basically let go, even after all of that. I don't know what happened with the uh, body shop. I would imagine they would want to press charges, but I don't know if they were even given that option. But anyway, it was ruled an accident. Okay, Seth's buried, and she goes back to Northeastern to complete her education. She had met in her freshman year a young man named James Anderson while they were both in the Dungeons and Dragons Club. Both of them science majors, both of them uh, kind of geeks, socially awkward, but they seemed to mesh well with each other. So he supported her through the whole Seth, Seth uh, debacle. They married just after they both graduated from uh, Northeastern in 1990. Uh, meanwhile, um, they both they moved to Boston where Seth, uh, excuse me, James, worked as a freelance computer engineer and she was actually accepted into the genetics PhD program at Harvard University. So they moved there to Boston, which is only about 20 minutes away from Braintree with, with all anticipations of her completing her doctorate. It did not come easy to her. She barely passed from all indications, but she did complete her PhD in genetics at Harvard within five years. And then she went on to take a l string of low paying research jobs. Research is very important, but lots of times, especially when you're just out of your doctoral training, you do what they call a fellowship and those don't pay. They're part schooling and part jobs, so they don't pay a whole lot. And uh, that's what she was doing. She went from research job to research fellowship to research job, very low paying. So the family was struggling. In the meantime, they had had four children. Uh, as I said, James was working as much as he could as a computer engineer, but they always had financial problems, which eventually she got a higher paying job at Boston Children's Hospital, which is a teaching hospital in the Boston area for most of the local Boston medical school. So it was a very prestigious job, one that would have led her to a lot of uh, good jobs. And she worked exclusively with uh, the herpes virus while there. I mean, there were some studies going on on how to develop a vaccine for both oral and genital herpes. So she worked exclusively in their research department with that. But there was a lot of problems. Her supervi supervisor, Dr. Paul Rosenberg, uh, wrote her up several times for having uh, temper outbursts in the lab, not getting along with coworkers, just generally being a nasty person. He said that her work was excellent, but her interpersonal skills were terrible. And after that review, she quit. She quit her job and she blamed Rosenberg's disdain, what she called disdain for her as a reason to quit the job. So she goes home. Uh, she tells James. Uh, James basically says, yes, he was wrong. I wish something bad would happen to him. Uh, he actually testified that he did say that. And Dr. Rosenberg felt a little uneasy but didn't think much of it. This was in uh, 1993. Well, about two weeks after she had resigned, Doctor, and this is just after the Unabomber, the whole uh, Oklahoma City bombing and the Unabomber incident had occurred. And so all that bombing stuff was fresh in everybody's mind. Well, Dr. Rosenberg came home and found an unmarked package with uncanceled stamps on it, 29 cent stamps, in between his main door and his screen door. Uh, he immediately became nervous and called the police. They send the bomb squad over who removes the package, opens it, and does find a trigger mechanism attached to two pipe bombs inside. Well, immediately he's asked, does he have any enemies? He said, I can only think of one, and he pinpointed Dr. Amy Bishop. They were both brought in, uh, both her and her husband were both brought in for questioning, but there wasn't enough evidence to convict them. So I'm not gonna say they, this is allegedly 
you know, there was no, never any proof, never any charges filed. So we can't say for sure that they had it, that they did do this, but it was maybe, maybe. But in any case, it shows that she's kind of unstable. To quit a job over one bad review instead of just learning, it was nothing about her work. It was about her attitude, just learn to get along with people better. But that would become a more of a pattern, as you can see, in her lifetime. Well, in the early 2000s, her and uh, James took their four children out to an international house of pancakes in the Boston area. And uh, she asked for a booster seat. It was a very busy Sunday morning. Uh, the waitress politely informed them they had just given the last one away. But as soon as one became available, she would, more, she would most definitely bring it over. Uh, she went ballistic. She screamed at the waitress saying, I am Dr. Amy Bishop. I'm Harvard trained. I'm a researcher. How dare you treat me this way? Get me that woman's booster seat, pointing to a family across the way there that had a booster seat. The waitress immediately said, no, we can't do that. I'm going to have to ask you to leave if you don't calm down. Well, of course, there was no calming her. She walked over to the family, proceeded to try to take the booster seat. Of course, that mom stood up to defend her child and Amy actually punched her in the face. Well, the police was, were called, uh, and still, for some reason, she was never charged. The, the incident was dropped. I think maybe they had to pay the, the woman's medical bills, but that was it. She was never arrested. These are three things in her past where she was never charged. What's up with the Massachusetts police force? I better never do a show in Massachusetts. They might come for me. But literally, what was up in the... 80s and 90s with the Massachusetts police. This is a dangerous woman who you have records of other incidents. Take her into custody. But they didn't. No charges filed. Uh, at that point, they were applying for jobs out of state. They felt they had went as far in the Boston area as they could. And in 2003, she was hired as a associate professor of biology and genetics at the University of Alabama at Huntsville, which contrary to proper belief, the University of Alabama system is very well respected in medical and biotech research. Um, it's a heavily researched school, so this was a good position. And she felt that in a smaller town like Huntsville, Alabama, which was high, highly STEM oriented, science, technology, engineering, mathematics oriented, that both her and James would flourish there because it's where the Huntsville Space Center is. NASA has a huge preference there. The University of Alabama system is there. It's, it's a good place to be a, a scientist, quite honestly. It's one of the few scientific hubs in the host state of Alabama. And I can say that because I live there and I'm from there. But so she goes to UAH and at first she flourishes. Her students love her. She would always stay after class to help them. She would give them extra credit on tests and papers if they needed it. It was, she was a good professor. And also at most state colleges, particularly a university like UAH, you are required to research and publish in scientific journals, peer reviewed journals. Um, so you have to publish and you have to research a lot. And she did, she published two to three articles a year in peer reviewed journals to excellent reviews. Peer reviewed journals are scientific and research journals where your articles are put up to the scrutiny of others in your field. So you can't bullshit on those. I mean, so she did. She did do that type of research to rave reviews. And also her and James together with his computer engineering know-how and her scientific know-how developed an electric Petri dish, which would keep cells alive longer. Most Petri dishes are, have a little a substance in the bottom that allows bacteria and viruses to grow so that you can look at it, but cells would die quite rapidly. Well, they developed a heated Petri dish that was electric that would allow the sales to survive much longer. And it brought in a million dollars in research funding to the university. Well, and then also once the patents were approved, James and Amy could expect a huge payout from whatever company decided to purchase it for them. So they were on easy street and Amy took that as a sign that she could go on cruise control. So she began being slack in her classes. Uh, complaints from students began coming in that she was simply reading from the textbook, uh, wouldn't really give extra credit, stay after class, help anyone, would basically call them stupid if they didn't get the lecture the first time. So it was basically, it was like a, a complete 180 with her. And also she stopped publishing. She went from doing two to three articles a year and doing research that brought in money to practically publishing zero. Well, in 2009, she was up for 
tenure and at public universities and some private you get what you call tenure when you've been at the university five to seven years usually and you have a good record they will give you tenure which means unless you burn the school down or you kill someone ironically you can't be fired and it's a great you have pension all that good stuff well she knew she just knew she was going to get this well unfortunately it was denied because of her lack of research and student compliance and just general she, her attitude even though it was good when she first got there had done another 180 and she was back to being the old amy bishop who's i'm amy bishop harvard trained that kind of thing where her co-workers didn't really like her and guys we got some rain starting to come down so i apologize um in 2009 her tenure was denied finally uh she did do an appeal but in february of 2010 that appeal went nowhere but she had pestered people to do a petition students and teachers alike a few of them came to her side but for the most part the university was done with her you're of no use to us you're not publishing you're lazy we don't want you and your contract will be up in spring of 2010 which meant she had one more semester to teach well february 12th 2010 Dr. Bishop arrived late February 12th. It was a Friday at 10 a.m. For her, for her 10 a.m. class at the Shelby Center for Science and Research at the University of Alabama at Huntsville. Uh, this is a picture of that building. Uh, she taught on the first floor. Uh, she normally carried a purse, but that day people noted that, students noted that she was carrying a large canvas bag instead of her normal purse and if they only knew what was in that bag but uh she uh according to her students that day she rushed in she rushed through her lecture in about 25 minutes and dismissed class early and then she was just kind of meandering around the halls until the 2 p.m faculty meeting that she attended again on the this time on the second floor now her survivors will note that it was unusual for her to be here because this was literally a meeting to discuss class loads and class assignments as well as hiring the her replacement and uh, hiring part-time or adjunct faculty to fill the class load for the next semester the 2010-2011 school year but or 2011-2012 school year uh, but she came in, she sat to the right of the her department chair, and she listened silently, didn't say a word, all, always keeping her canvas bag on her lap. Uh, no one paid her any mind, they just went on with their business. Of course, they everybody noted her reactions when they were talking about hiring the new full-time faculty, which was essentially her replacement. Um, I, I've often wondered why they didn't just ask her to leave, but I guess it's southern hospitality they didn't want to be rude so they just let her stay the faculty meeting concluded and they were there was just some chit chat going around um deborah moriarty who was a also an associate professor of biology uh, and someone who had worked really closely with uh, amy bishop uh, they'd even planned to publish a paper uh, that school year uh, together to try to uh, get a research grant uh, noted that she just simply kept fidgeting with the bag and she finally, at one point, just stood up, reached into the bag, pulled out what they what they could only recognize as a handgun. It turned out to be a Ruger P95 9mm. She began, she faced to her right and began shooting counterclockwise around the table. Well, of course, there was chaos, and eventually what happened was that she pointed the gun point blank at Professor Moriarty, Professor Moriarty said, hey, please don't think of my daughter, think of my grand, my grandson, I, please, you know me, I'm your friend, don't do this, I was trying to, I signed your petition to help get you stay, she said that the look on Professor Bishop's face, Dr. Bishop's face was absolutely blank, and she clicked, she pulled the trigger, the gun clicked, the, she had either ran out of ammo or the gun was jammed, and while she was trying to clear the jam, Professor Moriarty started backing into the hallway. Dr. Bishop followed her into the hallway, continuing to try to unclick the gun, all the time keeping it pointed at her. Well, Deborah th didn't fire. She stepped out into the hall and pointed the gun at me um, and pulled the trigger, and um, it clicked. 
and um, it clicked again. What were your thoughts? Professor Moriarty thought quick and dashed back into the room, slammed the door shut on Dr. Bishop, and the survivors, the ones that had not been shot to that point, started pushing the tech conference table up against the door and they used their cell phone to call 911 and then turned around to see if they could help the people that had been shot. There were six people shot that faithful winter afternoon. And here are a list of the victims of Dr. Bishop that afternoon. Uh, the top three did not survive. There were injuries that day. The first one shot was the department chair, the one who had essentially gave her her review and told her they would be dismissing her at the end of the school year. Dr. Gopi Padilla, he was a uh, Indian immigrant that had came over, studied here, and finally gotten what he called his dream job. He was he died instantly. He was shot point blank in the face. Next was Dr. Uh, Maria Raglan Davis, also an associate professor of biology. She was sitting directly to the left of Dr. Podella, and then to her left was Ariel, <clears throat> Dr. Adriel D. Johnson Sr., who also died. The other three, Luis Regulo Cruz Vera, was released from the hospital the next day with minor injuries. Dr. Joseph G. Uh, Lehe, sitting to her left, was released on April 14th, but was never the same after the shooting, uh, wasn't really productive at his job, at work, uh, anything, suffered uh, from chest pains a lot, and as a result, they say, of the stress induced by this episode, died of a heart attack in 2017. And finally, and I'm not trying to cut her name off because she's not a professor, but it's Stephanie Monticello. She was the, uh, the administrative assistant to the biology department, and she was released March 29, 2010. She had what they called borderline severe injuries uh, from, a sh from her shot to the upper body, and then after that, to her left was seated uh, Deborah, who was lucky enough that the gun jammed, and she was able to think quick, get her out in the hallway, and then get back inside. And most of the testimony, there was actually nine staff members, staff and faculty members in that room. Six of them were shot, three of them died. So a moment of remembrance for the, the, the three that were deceased. Uh, no one really saw what happened to Dr. Bishop uh, right away. She was no longer in the hallway, uh, but essentially she had walked to calmly to the second floor restroom, women's room, and according to people that were in the restroom, she just entered. She had something uh, in her pocket. She walked into the a stall and basically st stayed there until the other people had departed the bathroom, and she eventually got up, wrapped her phone, wrapped her coat around the uh, nine millimeter and put it in the uh, trash receptacle, and then headed without her jacket through the back corridor, out toward the loading dock. She actually flagged down a student that she knew and asked if she could use her cell phone. The student allowed her to. They, everybody was scrambling at this point because alarms had already been sounded and they were starting to clear the building. So the student was a little taken aback why you would want to use a phone at this point, but she did let her, again, Southern Hospitality. And she went out to the, she called her uh, husband, who they were supposed to have a date that night to come pick her up at the bat loading dock, which he later said he thought was strange and waited at the bat loading dock. Well, by this time, police and SWAT were swarming the UAH campus. Um, they were swarming the Shelby Center. They had locked it down. They began a room-to-room, -room, floor to floor search, eventually finding the victims in the conference room. They told them exactly who did it. They did not know where she went, so they started sweeping the building and eventually found her on the back dock, waiting for her husband, who happened to pull up at the exact time that they put her in the squad car. And a police officer is, has, was recorded by a reporter who had went around to the back tell, saying, what about the people that were shot? And she said, that didn't happen. They're still alive. And I'm going to put a clip of that interaction right here. Confused and bewildered, was immediately arrested at the scene. This didn't happen. There's no way. What about the people who died? There's no way. They're still alive. But arresting officer said she had a glazed look on her eye, uh, and her face was completely silent except for some incoherent babbling. James, her husband, just sat there in, in shock watching his wife being pushed into a squad car. She was transported and booked at the Madison County Jail in Huntsville, Alabama. 
Uh, she tried to, this was February 12th, she attempted suicide on February 13th and was put on 15 minute suicide watch. All the lights were on in her cell. She was not allowed to have anything in her cell except a religious book of her choice, which was the Christian Bible for her, and on complete suicide watch. And on February 20th, 2010, they received a call from a from the Braintree Police Department from an investigator who said, you might want to know about a cold case from 1986 that we're thinking about reopening and the woman you have in custody is the prime suspect in the shooting of her brother. So that came to light at the same time and then after further digging they found the incidents with the pipe bomb, potential even though no charges were ever filed and I said we can't really use that but the police did find that and then uh, later on with the assault, the assault at the local IHOP that had gotten swept under the rug. So all of this started to come out. And she, like I said, she was on suicide watch. Even though they, her family made a decent amount of money, she applied for a public defender saying that it would bankrupt the family. They did grant that to her and her attorney, who shall remain unnamed, he wanted to be kept as far away from the case as possible, literally said in a, a interview that she was Looney Tunes that she had no recollection of what happened that day. She was completely insane. Uh, some psychiatrists did evaluate her and said that she might have had borderline personality disorder or even schizophrenia, but no one was buying that. And uh, they wanted to pursue the death penalty in her case, but a plea deal was reached after a family of one of the victims who they didn't really name, wrote a letter to the judge asking for leniency and the DA asking for leniency that they would receive no comfort from taking another human life. So she was offered life without parole and she took it. And this was basically in retribution for both cases that had been reopened by this point, both her brother and this, that if she would plea it out, she would, she spent the rest of her life in prison, they would not pursue the death penalty. Or, and so she, currently resides September 24th. She was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. No appeals. In September uh, 2013, she did a file for an appeal with a new attorney saying that at the time she was not mentally capable and did not understand all the specifications of the plea deal. The Alabama Supreme Court denied that, saying that she was absolutely coherent, that they would not allow a plea deal to go through without it was fully explained to her. She acknowledged it. She signed this is her punishment. And uh, also in 2012, she was charged with assaulting another inmate and a prison guard at the Julia Tutwiler Prison for Women in Wetumpka, Alabama, and that's where she sits. No, no formal chart, no formal charges or punishment were ever levied about the uh, other inmate or the guard, but she was placed in solitary confinement for a while, and she literally sits in jail today for the murder of three people, attempted murder of the other three people, and supposedly for the death of her brother, though Massachusetts has not yet uh, decided to commence with that. They are reinvestigating, so even though they agreed that they that she should accept this Alabama penalty and she sits in jail in Alabama, we still don't know what the outcome of that case will be. So there you have it, folks. Uh, Dr. Amy Bishop, Harvard trained, not too intelligent. What do you think? Do you think she was crazy? Do you think she actually had memory of the murders? Or do you think this was cold calculating? Because Deborah Moriarty, as I said, the one that talked mostly to the police, the ones you saw in some clips that I had earlier, uh, said that she was completely, she did it execution style. She knew exactly who she wanted to kill first and basically went around the table doing that. So they always, they, they none of them were buying the insanity plea. So, but what do you think? And also, I'm going to end this with uh, some commentary from James Anderson, her husband. And what do you think about him? Do you think he was, com the, the, he and he, she actually sent the pipe bomb to her former supervisor? Or do you think, do you think James is innocent in this? Do you think he knew it was happening? Or do you think he's another innocent victim? Anyway, let me know. Uh, thunder's starting to roll, so I'm going to take that as an indication I need to stop filming. So thanks, guys, for everything. Like, comment, share, subscribe. Ketosis, y'all. Keto comic. Out. So, the whole why did this happen? How did it happen? And then 
how do I get up the next day and take care of the kids? I don't make sure that they're shielded, isolated, and insulated from this. Is that the and I told him, Mom's, you know, not coming back for a while. And how's he taking that news? He's, he's so far okay with that. So, but I've got to watch him like a hawk. Does he understand anything about what's happened? No. I said he's eight. You know, I've talked to his uh, teachers. I mean, nobody in the class understands. You know, the kids just are too young to comprehend this. Does he know what happened? Has he heard? He's heard, but he doesn't, like I said, he doesn't comprehend it. And your other three kids are teenagers, so they, they comprehend this. They comprehend. This. And how are they managing? They're, they're holding together. That's all I can say. For now, this